How many Canadians know of a very successful federal program implemented more than six decades ago that's been described as the glue that keeps the country together? I'm betting not very many, which is why we're going to spend part of tonight's program talking about it. The Art of Sharing, The Richer Versus the Poorer Provinces Since Confederation, is a new book about the equalization program, which ensures that the better off parts of Canada help the parts that are worse off. Author Mary Janigan has her doctorate in Canadian history, writes about public policy, and she joins us now from Mono Township, about an hour northwest of our studio. Mary, it's great to see you again. How are you doing? I'm fine. Thank you for having me. Not at all. Well, let's start with that quote, because you're the one who describes equalization as the glue that keeps the country together. How so? It is a program that redistributes federal money to the poorer provinces so that they can provide whatever programs their citizens really need without desperately high taxes. In most instances, this means really better health care and education. It's vital. Uh, Mary, it was actually Louis Saint Laurent's government back in 1957 that brought in equalization. So tell us how you think over the six plus decades that it's been in, how it's improved Canada. Without equalization, we wouldn't have national shared cost programs. And those programs are vital. Uh, it allowed poorer provinces to participate in hospital care and Medicare to pay their share of post-secondary education. Without it, there would be huge problems. Uh, it's inconceivable that the poorer provinces would have been able to keep up, and that remains so today. Atlantic Canada could not be providing good health care, good education, without access to equalization grants. But they're this, vital. Is this uniquely Canadian, or are there other countries that do this too? Every major developed federation in the world has some form of equalization. If it doesn't, it usually does, does not last. The only country that does not have these forms of grants to poorer states is the United States. Arguably, they do it through defense contracts, through grants pegged for certain things. But there are huge gaps in educational uh, educational provisions between the poor and the richer states in the United States. It's a problem for the Americans. Hmm. Well, this is a program that transfers $20 billion a year all around the country, so it's clearly a very big deal. Which provinces, in your view, are happy with it and which ones are not? Actually, there's no province that's happy. <laughs> the provinces that are not receiving it are malcontent, and the provinces that are receiving it think it's not enough. Maybe that's the best we can do in a federation like Canada. One of the great difficulties is Alberta and then Saskatchewan have had economic problems during the middle of this past decade. And they really resented the fact that they were not getting equalization. They felt they should. Uh, there is another program for them, which is stabilization. And there are experts, economists, including Trevor Toome, who have looked at this program and suggested way to, a way to fix it, and arguably to ensure that there is a greater degree of happiness among the recipients and the non-recipients. It's the best we can do, but the program is vital. Well, with that background in place, let's add two other voices to our conversation about the program that Mary calls the glue that keeps Canada together. So let's welcome, in Calgary, Alberta, the aforementioned Trevor Toome. He is an assistant professor of economics at the University of Calgary. And in downtown Toronto, there's Nathalie Desrosiers, a constitutional okay. scholar who is the principal at Massey College at the University of Toronto. And we welcome you two to our conversation as well. Trevor, come on in here first. You've heard what Mary has to say about how essential she feels this program is to keeping Canada together. What say you? I couldn't agree more. I mean, this program is intended to ensure that provinces have the capacity to deliver normal levels of public services without having to resort to abnormally high rates of taxation. So equalization tries to measure how much a province would raise if it had average taxes. And then it tops up any province with 
below average amounts up to a national average level. And so that means provinces like PEI and New Brunswick receive roughly $3,000 per person uh, through this program to help them deliver necessary public services, while provinces like Alberta and BC that have a, a really strong ability to raise revenue because their economies generate above average levels of income, for example, they don't receive any. And I think that's that's the intent to unequally provide transfers to support those who need it and not those who don't. Trevor, I wonder whether those comments would be seen as somewhat treasonous or heretical by others in Alberta who feel the program is a disaster and is costing Albertans too much. Um, I don't know. Speak to that if you would. Well, there's no question that Alberta has gone through some pretty difficult years since the recession in 2015 and 16. Its economy shrank by roughly 20% over those two years. That means fewer jobs, lower incomes, and as we see in the provincial budget, very large deficits. And so a lot of people will see those uh, disturbing uh, facts in, in Alberta and then point to equalization as a program that is meant to help. But Alberta went into that recession in the number one spot uh, in terms of economic activity and average incomes, and then it fell 20% and remained in the number one spot. So I think there's a lack of appreciation here about just how strong Alberta's economy is relative to the rest of Canada. And our deficit is largely a choice that we make. We have above average levels of spending and below average levels of taxation. And historically, we could bridge the gap between those two sides of the budget through resource revenues, primarily from oil and gas. In the last few years, that's just um, really evaporated and quite rapidly. But it's not equalization that is uh, there to support provinces that gamble on resource revenues. It's really up to Albertans to solve our own fiscal challenges. And we're very slowly coming to terms with that. All right, Natalie, let me get your view on one thing Mary said, which I found interesting. When I asked her which provinces liked it and which ones didn't, she said nobody likes it. So if nobody likes it, is this really a good program? That probably is a good program because it does reflect the fact that it is a compromise. And certainly I think uh, over time we can adjust the formula or try to adjust. But the essence of it, which is if you're in a country, you want to ensure that all provinces, all parts of the country can offer a minimum amount of services. Otherwise, there's no point in having freedom of movement because you wouldn't know, for example, what type of education system comes from a poor province. So it's essential. In a way, a federation is left like a marriage. You're in it for the good and the bad, you know, better and for worse. And and that's part of it. This this system is really, and it's now guaranteed in our in our constitution that we uh, are committed to a, a minimum level of services equal throughout the country. Well, we've got a chart here which shows which are the have and which are the have not provinces. So, uh, thank you, Sheldon. Thanks for bringing that up. And let's just uh, some people are listening to us right now on podcast and they can't see this, so I'll describe it a little bit. If you look along the bottom where the four zeros are, Alberta, British Columbia. Move over to the right some more, Ontario and Saskatchewan. Those are the four have provinces. They do not receive equalization. But as you look at Manitoba, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and then look at Quebec. Quebec, the, the, I mean, the red bar on that bar chart goes right up to heaven. So, Mary, we, we really need to focus on that red bar because obviously there are places in Canada which feel that Quebec is really disproportionately considering how well its, in, its uh, economy is doing, disproportionately enjoying equalization benefits they should not be entitled to. What's the view on that? Uh, they are entitled to them, number one. Number two, Quebec always looks high because it has more people than the other recipients. In Quebec, it's per capita payments. In all the, the recipients, it's per capita uh, recipients. The Atlantic provinces actually receive quite a lot more per person. I believe Nova Scotia, no, New Brunswick is now the highest. So you're looking at a system that appears to favor one province disproportion disproportionately when that is actually not the case. It's just because it has more people. Well, uh, Trevor, I'm going back to you on this, because yeah. if anybody in Alberta saw that bar graph, <laughs> methinks they wouldn't like it too much. How does this play out there? Well, Mary's absolutely right to note that the payments are based on your population. We calculate your ability to raise revenue per person 
and compare that to the national average. PEI's population of 150,000 people, compare that to Quebec's population of 8.5 million people. So the per capita payment of about $1,500 per person to Quebec adds up to many more dollars than the $3,100, more than double Quebec, uh, in, in equalization payments to PEI. Now here in Alberta, looking at Quebec, often you hear that, well, Quebec is running a surplus, they receive payments, Alberta is running a deficit, we do not, therefore the program is unfair. But it is important to remember that Quebec tax rates are significantly higher than many other provinces and certainly much higher than Alberta. On average, across income and sales and property taxes, the whole gamut, they're roughly double. Uh, the tax rates that we see in Alberta. So again, it goes back to budget choices that that provinces uh, make. Even though, of course, uh, that 13 billion dollar bar that you had on the on the graph there, it does stand out. But that's just because Quebec is big. Well, having said that, Natalie, the fact is you can't really look. I, I don't think people look at these things uh, in a vacuum. They yeah. all get mixed up yeah. together, right? And Quebec's yeah. lack of support for the oil and gas sector in Alberta, no doubt, hasn't helped Albertans feel yummy about sending all this money out, <laughs> uh, out to Quebec. So how do you think this all works itself out in terms of national unity and trying to keep Canada together? Well, I think it, it, the story of the book of Mary also is that you it's incumbent about the federal government to continually explain well, but also listen to the, the gripes uh, across the country. And I know Albertans are, are uh, unhappy now, and probably they will want to be accommodated somewhat. But I think the graph is a bit misleading, as, as has been mentioned. It would be a better graph if it shows per person, per capita, as opposed to just per province, because that's what it's all about, is to ensure that the capacity of a province is to deliver to its own citizens, to its own residents. So I think that's important um, that, you know, we might want to just kind of toy the message a little bit, make sure the right information <laughs> and, uh, is, is, is out there. Uh, but certainly I think we know this, uh, is, this federation is always in, uh, in a state of, of debate and so on. And it does evolve. Sometimes some provinces move from being the haves to the have-nots. And that's part of the equalization promise, is that, you know, eventually things could change. Some provinces that were poor became richer, like Saskatchewan's a good example, for example, depending on, on what happens with their geography, with the change of the uh, economy, uh, worldwide or even national economy. So I think the, the point of equalization is it's, it's a gamble, but it's a gamble about staying in Canada and, and wanting to share. It's the art of sharing. The art of sharing. That sounds like a good title for a book. Um, okay, Mary, um, you know, it wasn't that long ago that Ontario was actually considered a have-not province because our economy was doing so poorly. Did Ontario actually draw down on equalization when it was a have-not province? Yes, it collected equalization, which is what equalization is there for. When a wealthier province goes below the average taxes that are collected across the country. One of the things about equalization that's important is it's a program. It, it Sure, it's about moral obligation to share across territory. But it's also a very pragmatic, hard-headed program. So if the details are not working, if the program is not functioning properly, then what you have to do is change it, tinker with it, remake it. Alberta has some legitimate problems right now. It is possible to change the program that it receives to ensure that it gets more money per capita for drastic dro drops in revenue. It is a very good way of fixing things. Don't throw out the program, adjust the details. Well, now you're talking about the art of the possible as opposed to the art of sharing. <laughs> And to that, I'm going to the former politician among us, because, Natalie, you were, of course, once upon a time yeah. a member of the Ontario legislature. And we're now talking about the realm of politics here. When the Trudeau mm -hmm. government um, announced in 2018 that it was not going to renegotiate the equalization agreement, but rather freeze in place the status quo for five years, 
That made a lot of people unhappy. What, do you think it was the right move to freeze the, the current agreement rather than renegotiate it? Well, there's always an issue about do you spend a lot of energy renegotiating at that time or do you develop alternative programs? I mean, I think Mary is right. Uh, it is a program. It should be tinkered with. It should be adapted. And I think I'm part of, uh, as many are, of looking at what alternatives there could be in the in the future for this program. But there are others, and that's not the only uh, program that exists to support a vision of equality among citizens in Canada. So I think uh, I think it will have to be uh, readjusted, probably. But the fundamental way that I think we want to say, and the key message here, is when Alberta says we want to opt out of this program, we're trying to say that's not the right way, because it is an important program for all of us and for the future of the Federation, essentially. We should explain, I guess, Mary, that, that Alberta is not... It's not the taxpayers of Alberta that are actually sending money to the taxpayers of Quebec, right? That's not how it works. It's not a province to province <laughs> transfer, right? No, it's been a very difficult thing to clarify. Jason Kenney keeps talking about Alberta sending money and look at the amount Quebec's getting. Actually, all federal taxpayers, they send the money to Ottawa and Ottawa redistributes it. Uh, that charge that Alberta is sending money has been very damaging, and it's wrong. Hmm. All right. In which case, Trevor, uh, let me get your view on this, because uh, Jason Kenney, the premier of Alberta, has often talked about having a referendum among Alberta citizens to see whether or not equalization should continue. Can you talk to us about the pluses and minuses of having a referendum on this issue? Sure, and it does look like that that will go ahead in October of this year. So Mary mentioned earlier in the program the stabilization uh, program federally. This is this is separate from equalization, meant to support provinces that have big drops in revenue. Uh, the federal government did expand the size of that program so that it would cover more of revenue drops of provinces, but it wasn't as much as what Alberta was hoping for. And so, in response, uh, Premier Kenny here did recommit to a referendum, and I have a real hard time seeing him backing down from that commitment. So in October, Albertans will vote. I won't uh, speculate on which way it will go, but if they vote to remove equalization from the Constitution, this doesn't really have any legal force. No. Equalization is a federal program completely at uh, the uh, discretion of the federal government to design and implement. It's not something that provinces have any formal role in at all. Uh, politically, I think another angle of the referendum is that they want to, quote, force the federal government to the table uh, in order to negotiate equalization. But there is already ongoing negotiations between the federal and provincial governments. There's a standing committee on fiscal transfers that meets roughly twice a year. Uh, and so any concerns, and, and there are legitimate concerns, can be raised and explored and discussed through the regular procedures that already exist. So we're already at the table. The referendum doesn't have any legal force. It's really um, a, a uniquely political tool that might serve provincial uh, provincial ends rather than changing anything federally. Well, a uniquely political tool, okay. Um, we've already established that it has no constitutional mm -hmm. heft, and the federal government uh, obviously doesn't have to be... Uh, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to do anything based on the outcome of this referendum. But, Natalie, again, let's talk the politics here. If 80% of Albertans, for example, said, yeah. this is not working for us and we think it ought to be scrapped, I mean, that's not really a number that the federal government can ignore, can they? Well, I, th yeah, the political calculus is that it will force probably uh, a better program or a tinkering of the program or maybe new programs to, to, be, to, be, uh, to be developed. Yeah, I think the lesson is always that you cannot have a federation where people want to move out of it. You know, I think we've, mm -hmm. we've seen that with uh, the way responded to the Quebec referendums existed. So so that's the I think that's the tool that that is uh, doing and and you're right if it, it doesn't have a legal leg to stand on but it what it seeks to do is try to push the political agenda in a certain direction. The answer could simply be 
slight changes to the equalization, not abandon it. I think everybody would want, would say you cannot do it and you should not do it, but maybe adjust other programs as well, like, uh, uh, you know, the stabilization and other ways to respond to the real concern. And I, I think Mary's book shows that this ability of the federal government to listen to the way in which the, the the provinces react as help the program be a better one you know uh, it and I think that's uh, another lesson from from that book well Mary how much appetite do you think there is in Ottawa these days to to do something about the equalization formula which finds very little favor from coast to coast to coast if I were the finance minister I would never take my eyes off equalization I would never ever stop looking at it it is a program that's almost a poll <laughs> of Canada and of how to keep Canada together. Last November, the finance minister, Christopher Freeland, made changes, as Trevor referred to, in the stabilization program. But she didn't do enough. And meanwhile, there are serious issues with the equalization program. The feds just simply reconfirm the existing formula till 2024. But that doesn't stop them from making some changes. Right now, of course, we've got a minority government and a lot of problems. But I think that would be the reason why you would start paying more attention to adjusting these formulas fast. <laughs> Mary, in our last minute here, I do want to ask you the ultimate political question, which is, this is a plan that has been in place, as we've said, for six decades. Louis Saint Laurent's government brought it in all those years ago. And when Mr. Saint Laurent went back to the polls to get <laughs> Canadians to either endorse or reject what he had come up with, a program that has stood the test of time, what did they do? Ah, uh, poor man. It was his proudest accomplishment in Dominion provincial relations. But he couldn't sell it anymore. He was quite tired and he was a bit depressed. John Deefen argued that it was taking too much money from Ontario and it was not giving enough money to Atlantic Canada. He said the feds were acting as if they always know best with the provinces. Diefenbaker was a vigorous campaigner. He won a minority government. Saint Laurent was defeated. His great accomplishment was basically not recognized for decades. There's a lesson in there about not doing big things in <laughs> politics, which is exactly the opposite lesson we probably want people to infer. But there you go. Uh, I want to thank the three of you for coming on to TVO tonight and helping us out with this. Mary Janigan is the author of The Art of Sharing, The Richer Versus the Poorer Provinces Since Confederation. Our thanks as well to Trevor Toome at the University of Calgary and Natalie Desrosiers at Massey College. Uh, all good wishes to all three of you. Thanks for coming on to TVO tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.